All right, so I'm going to start my talk uh, for today, which is uh, scleroderma lung disease. Um, there's a lot to cover. Hey guys, is starting. It's 10 after. 15 after. I it just means the mic on. Uh, sure. Did you put it on that uh, Yeah. All right, you're good. Okay. Uh, so we're going to cover a lot, and we're going to start with a little bit of an overview uh, of scleroderma itself before we get into the lung disease part. So no disclosures that I have. Um, no. Um, objectives, we're going to cover epidemiology uh, very briefly. We're going to go over a quick overview of scleroderma um, as a disease uh, before we go into lung disease. And uh, within the lung disease, we're going to focus on ILD and uh, P, uh, pH um, and an emphasis on screening. Um, and then we'll end with treatment. So with epidemiology, very briefly, um, incidence of scleroderma itself is uh, 21 cases in a million, with the prevalence being higher around 276 in a million. It's predominantly a female. Um, of uh, 4 to 1, and a little bit more uh, likely to be seen in uh, black as opposed to white. Um, mean age of diagnosis is mid-40s. So before we get into lung disease, I think it's important to talk a little bit about scleroderma so that we can tie that in um, later on. And so this is really the diagnostic criteria that's used to make a diagnosis of scleroderma, um, and it's basically um, scoring points, and then once you hit a score of 9 and above, um, you can uh, come to a definitive diagnosis of scleroderma. Um, of note here for us is you get, two, you get two points for each pH and ILD, and then specifically with skin manifestations, if you have skin thickening of both hands proximal to the MCPs, that automatically scores you nine points, so that earns you the diagnosis. Pan pathogenesis, very briefly, um, basically is uh, um, immune dysregulation, uh, vascular uh, reactivity, and all of this basically ends up leading to collagen deposition and fibrosis with tissue remodeling. Um, and so I'm not going to belabor this because we have a lot more to get into. This is a little bit of the clinical exam manifestations that you can see uh, in scleroderma. Um, and so right here you see um, basically contractors as a result of the skin thickening. This is your Raynaud's. Um, and again, this is more of the skin thickening that you'll see. If you notice here, this is more proximal to the MCPs. These are the digital tip ulcers that you can see. And then I want to emphasize the tel uh, telangiectasias, which um, are a prominent feature on examination with patients. Um, and then these are the calcinosis cutis that you can see. And those radiographically, you can see calcium depositions on radiographs. Um, also, capillaroscopy is used um, in assisting with diagnosis of um, <coughs> and really to, to of, of scleroderma and this is basically <coughs> a normal architecture here and you see that they start to dilate as you go along the spectrum of disease you start getting um, hemorrhage and you start losing the architecture and here your archi architecture is completely um, basically um, gone in the later form of scleroderma as the disease progresses. This slide is important because it's going to help us focus in on what we're going to be talking about in a bit, which is the lung manifestations. Um, so scleroderma itself is split into systemic versus localized. Our emphasis is going to be on the systemic portion, specifically limited and diffuse. And limited and diffuse really refers to the distribution of skin disease. Um, sign scleroderma is a form of systemic scleroderma with no skin manifestations. So there's no skin thickening. Sign, yeah. Thin it. Thin it, sorry. Um, but we're going to be focusing on the limited and diffuse, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about Cine as well. So this is a distribution you see with limited, and basically it's anything proximal skin involvement, proximal to the clavicle, distal to the elbows, and distal to the knees. Um, and then with diffuse, really can be anywhere. Um, what you'll see, just to highlight a few differences here, and we'll go into this in a little bit, um, you see some antibody differences um, with diffuse, you're just going to see your SCL70, with your crest, you're going to see more of the anti-centromere antibody. But again, there can be overlap. Um, and then typically, you'll see more ILD <coughs> in diffuse, and you'll see more pulmonary hypertension in limited. But again, you can have overlap. This is a little bit of um, just a time course for how the disease progresses. And you'll see that this is plotting of the skin thickness and years. And you'll see that early on, the diffuse disease, which is in blue, um, has a lot of skin thickening that's noted early on in disease and not so much with the limited as you would expect. But what's important to note is that the 
multi-organ involvement is seen earlier on within the disease of uh, diffuse as opposed to later on within uh, limited. And again, to highlight that's more pulmonary <coughs> hypertension and limited and more likely to be ILD and diffuse. These are some of the antibodies that you can see within scleroderma. Um, and I'm only going to highlight two, which are uh, the SCL70, also known as tupoi polysomerase, and the centromere. And again, this is more with diffuse. The centromere is more with limited. Um, and again, hence, you see the lung fibrosis, or ILD, and more pulmonary hypertension with the centromere. And this is our crux of our topic, which is lung disease. So the question is, why is this important, and why are we talking about this today? Um, and then to answer that is to go back a little bit in time and to realize that what drove mortality um, a long time ago with, res with regards to scleroderma used to be the renal crisis that used to occur. But you could see with ACE inhibitors that changed dramatically. If you imagine at one year that dramatic reduction in mortality just with the use of ACE inhibitors. So as you can imagine what took place uh, of driving mortality after the introduction of ACE inhibitors um, was lung disease. And so it accounts for up to 60% of deaths in patients with scleroderma. Um, furthermore, it's quite common, but also under-recognized. Um, and why it's important is because if you recognize it, you could poten potentially treat it. So there's a broad scope of lung involvement that you can see within scleroderma. Our focus is going to be on parenchymal, specifically ILD, um, and the pulmonary vascular disease, um, pulmonary hypertension. I'll also note that esophageal disease plays a role here because you get aspiration. And then you see a whole broad spectrum as well. So again, just to emphasize this, a c the combination of both ILD and pulmonary hypertension together in patients with scleroderma is a cause of up to 60% of mortality. And just to emphasize this again, ILD is seen more with diffuse disease and pulmonary hypertension is seen more with limited disease. So, that being said, nothing's exclusive to any one disease. And you can see all of the above mentioned manifestations in any of the um, spectrums of disease. So you can see all of them in either the diffuse form, the limited form, and even the CNA. <laughs> so, to talk a little bit about CNA, um, this can cause a diagnostic uh, challenge because these patients won't come in with the clinical you know, skin manifestations that you would expect to see with scleroderma. However, they are just as likely to have ILD, and in fact, up to 80% of them can have ILD. Um, and so these patients can often be misdiagnosed as having idiopathic ILD, when in fact, this is related to a known cause, which is scleroderma. <coughs> so to avoid misclassifying these patients, it's important, again, to consider some of the workup that you'd be considering, as well as other clinical manifestations um, of scleroderma that we've gone up over a little bit earlier. So, the next important point to emphasize here is that while ILD disease is very common, um, it's more so likely to be present with early on in the disease. And so up to 25% of pa patients develop clinically significant disease within the first three years after diagnosis of scleroderma. And we're talking about systemic scleroderma here. And these are the risk factors. So we've touched on a few of these. Um, pattern of disease, specifically the diffuse form is gonna be uh, favoring ILD, being African-American, skin scores, and then your antibody, which again goes with your um, diffuse form of disease. Um, there's some other markers here. Um, with regards to severity, things that are predict severity of um, ILD defined by an FBC less than 50% of predicted is gonna be driven by, again, being African-American, more likely male, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about this, but physiological abnormalities are going to re really refer to uh, your PFT findings, and specifically your FBC and your DLCL. And again, being younger um, with ILD is going to be predictive of developing more severe um, disease. So when you do screening PFTs in a population of patients with diffuse um, scleroderma, what you find is that you'll a reduction in FBC in a majority of patients, up to 75% of them. Um, and then of these, 15% will have severe reduction, again, defined by an FEC lower than 50% of predicted. Um, DLCO is almost always reduced when you, have a lower, when you have a low FEC, but you can have a reduction in DLCO independent of any uh, reduction of uh, FEC. And then DLCO does correlate with the extent of disease that you would find on um, 
CAT scan imaging. Both FVC and DOCR, as you'd imagine, are uh, play a role in prognosticating. Um, but it's DLCO that's the single most significant marker of a poor outcome. However, that being said, you can't get away with just doing PFTs to screen for ILD because you're going to miss people. And if you look here, it's a little bit cut out, but basically as you trend the false negative rates with adding more variables in your PFTs, you'll find that you'll drop that, but at the expense of raising your po false positives. And all this is really meant to show here is that you need more than just PFTs. That's why you need your high-risk CAT scan. So most patients, will up to 84% of them, will have um, detectable disease on high-risk CTs. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're symptomatic. Um, now most of the time, these patients will have limited disease, and that was found to be around 30% involvement of the lung. Um, however, you can also have patients with PFT changes but normal findings on high-risk CAT scan, which is why you want to use both the PFTs and your high-risk CAT scan. The next important point here is that if you have a normal high-risk CAT scan initially when the diagnosis is made, the likelihood for progression and development of ILD um, later on is, <coughs> is low. So 85% of people will continue to have a normal high-risk CAT scan five years out from that initial CAT scan. So that's a good sign. These are some of the sort of um, findings you can see um, when it comes to um, the high-risk CAT scan. So most of the times you're going to end up seeing either ground glass changes or fibrosis or a mix of both. You'll also find up to 40% of patients some degree of honeycombing, um, and then you can also develop bronchiectatic disease. This shows um, a distribution of findings on high-risk CAT scan in patients who have symptomatic um, ILD and so you'll find that the majority of patients will have fibrosis and ground glass, um, and then a significant proportion will also have honeycombing. These are some of the other diagnostic uh, tools uh, that, that have been looked at. Um, so BAL findings in patients with uh, ILD. So most patients are going to have abnormal findings, and abnormal is defined by an elevation in your PMNs and your eosinophils. Um, However, you can still have patients who have a normal high-risk CAT scan um, and then end up having <coughs> abnormalities on their BAL. So it doesn't really help a whole lot. So really the only role for a BAL is to rule out infections um, and for sort of re uh, research purposes. But it does not add any prognostic information any more uh, so than when using PFTs and uh, high-risk CAT scan. When it comes to pathology, the most common histologic pattern you're going to see in patients with ILD um, is going to be NSIP, and that's up to 77% of patients. Most of the time, it's going to be fibrotic as opposed to the cellular type. Um, and the second most common pattern that you'll see is UIP. So the question then arises is, do you need pathology? Um, and the answer is generally no, because whether or not you have NSIP or UIP as a pattern, is not going to affect your prognosis. Um, the only time it's used is if you're unclear as to what the diagnosis is. So maybe a pe person with CINE or some other, um, <coughs> you know, so you have some other confounding variables that make you question whether or not the patient might have scleroderma-related ILD. Um, and again, b it does not affect prognosis. Both groups um, are going to end up having similar mortality. At 10 years out, you'll have between 29 and 69% uh, um, survival. A ton. Both. Both of them. Both of what? Both. So, so UIP and NSIP are both types of NSIP. No, both UIP and NSIP. All right. This is a little bit of uh, pathology that you see here. This is the fibrotic type of NSIP, and you see the thickening of the alveoli. See a lot of the fibrosis the, um, there, and this is the sort of the what you would expect to see on the CAT scan. And this is the more cellular type. Um, it's <coughs> less, less magnified, but if you were to magnify it more, you'd see a lot more cellularity. Um, and again, you'd see this more with uh, the, the ground glass changes on CAT scan. This is pathology that you'd see on in patients who have pulmonary hypertension in the setting of scleroderma. So you'd see the intimal and the medial hyperplasia in the arteries, and you'll see the intimal hyperplasia in the veins. And that's just a gross architecture of what the lung would look like. <coughs> 
So when it comes to pulmonary artery hypertension, um, above and beyond ILD, this is going to drive your mortality even further. Um, and in fact, in patients who have uh, pulmonary artery hypertension related to scleroderma, their mortality is three times higher than patients who have idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension um, in other group one, uh, group one disease. So um, the of note, to go back to this again, is you're more likely to see pulmonary artery hypertension in the limited form of systemic scleroderma um, as opposed to the diffuse form. Um, however, the PAH, unlike the ILD, which we talked about earlier, ILD is typically going to be seen earlier on in the course. PH can devel develop at any time during the course of disease, um, and that's just something to note. The other thing to note here is that in addition to mixed connective tissue disease, patients with scler uh, systemic uh, sclerosis have the highest prevalence of PH in patients with collagen vascular disease. If you take that whole subset, those are the two groups of patients that are going to have the highest prevalence of uh, PH. So that's to know. So the grouping uh, that you'll <coughs> see is typically group one, but also because of the concomitant ILD that you can see with patients, you're going to also have group three, and then a lot of patients can also have group two, but in order it's probably going to be group one, three, followed by two. Uh, the prevalence of pH on screening with an echocardiogram, uh, and this is a transthoracic Doppler echocardiogram, is going to be somewhere up to 35%, and that's on a screening. Um, now, if you take patients um, who are, um, if you take patients who have idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension, um, and you compare them to patients who have systemic sclerosis-related pulmonary hypertension, the systemic sclerosis patients are more likely to be older, more likely to be sicker, and have a poor outcome. So we're going to bring back DLCO um, here, um, and it has a role as in, the, in PH as well as it did in ILD. And so you're likely to see a moderate reduction in DLCO, and that's around the 50%. Um, also, you're also likely to see perhaps, um, this is important because this is specific to um, PH and systemic sclerosis. So an FVC over a DLC ratio, that ratio that's more than 1.4% or a DLCO that's low and continues dec to decline without any other experimental cause, uh, those are all indicative of the possible development of pu future pulmonary artery hypertension. All right? Um, and then other studies um, have looked at DLCO also as a predictor of uh, pH and systemic scleroderma and found that DLCO can be predictive. One study found that a DLCO less than 60% without concomitant ILD and another study found less than 43% without ILD um, was a very good predictor of the potential development of pulmonary artery hypertension. Question. Yes? So, no, you can have, you can have, so actually, um, so I'll be talking about it where you can combine both diseases and you can separate them. Yeah. These are the risk factors for pH. Um, so again, having limited disease that ties in with the anti-centromere antibody. And then a lot of these are clinical manifestations that you, used to see with, uh, that you can see with the limited form of disease. So things like esophageal dysvolatility, um, you know, your sclerodactyly, telangiectasia, so a lot of vascular phenomena. And interestingly here, a higher ESR and IgG level was also known to be a risk factor. Uh, but of note is having limited form and having the anti-centromere antibody. So when you have a combination of pH and ILD in a patient, um, with systemic sclerosis, um, that's where you have your group three disease, um, and this, as expected, has an increased mortality as compared to either of the two diseases alone. And so three-year survival is under 40% for combined disease, as opposed to having a 65% survival in isolated disease um, alone. Uh, and again, the prevalence of isolated pH, and I think maybe if this gets at, at the point, so if you have isolated pH as opposed to pH with ILD is roughly around 20%. So you'll have 20% of patients who have isolated P, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension, and you can have, again, roughly 20% who are going to have a combination of pulmonary hypertension and an ILD going on. So probably 20% have group 1 and another 20% have um, group, group 3. So when you combine the two diseases, you'll find that uh, these patients are likely to be diagnosed when they're older, uh, have a higher incidence of the presence of um, the topoisomerase antibody um, and diffuse disease, which again, these two go together compared to when you have uh, PAH alone without ILD. Uh, 
Um, and as expected, with increasing um, restriction, you're more likely to have a higher uh, instance of uh, pH. And 50% of patients who have an FBC that's lower than 50% of predicted um, are going to be found to have um, pH on an echocardiogram. So when you have a DLCO that's low, however, in the setting of concomitant ILD, that can't be used um, as a predictor of pulmonary artery hypertension. So if you have no ILD and you have a drop in DLCO, that can predict uh, the development of pulmonary hypertension. But if you have both diseases together, you cannot use DLCO as a predictor. So coming to treatment. Um, and so this is, this is again why it's important. So mortality, and we're going to focus on treatment of ILD um, and less so on the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary hypertension portion. So mortality with ILD and in patients who have severe restrictions, so again, FEC less than 50%, is 42% at 10 years out. Um, and th that's pretty significant. The unfortunate news is that there's been no treatment to date that showed a mortality benefit. However, uh, this is why we do treat patients, uh, because the studies that have been done have looked at other variables uh, for which there has been improvement, and that's been improvements in dyspnea, pulmonary function, specifically your FBC, um, your quality of life, your functional ability, and skin thickness scores. And so these are the measures that most of the studies are going to show benefits in, which as, as we talk about. The next question that arises is, who are we going to treat? Since the, since the prevalence and incidence can be so high in patients with um, systemic scleroderma, um, again, up to 85% of patients are going to have CAT scan findings of ILD, um, and a large portion are going to have um, abnormalities and PFTs. The question is, who are we going to treat? And so this is an algorithm that we'll talk about, and we'll get to the study that, that produced this algorithm, that's going to help you decide um, who's going to need treatment and who's going to be a uh, more favorable candidate for surveillance. Um, and so it hinges on your PFT and your high risk CT scan. As we had talked about earlier, those are prognosticators. Um, and then with them being abnormal, you split up into either having extensive lung disease and limited lung disease. Patients with extensive lung disease get treatment, and patients with limited lung disease, you basically need to have frequent surveillance. The question that arises is, what defines limited and what defines extensive lung disease? And this is an overview of what that definition is. So this algorithm uh, basically primarily uses high-risk CAT, high CAT scan findings um, to grade the severity of disease. Um, and if the, the, the degree of, invo of lung involvement is less than 20%, that's termed limited. Anything more than 20% is termed extensive. However, if you're somewhere in the middle, that's where your FVC can play a role in helping guide whether or not you're in the extensive or the limited uh, branch. So an FVC that's less than 70% fits more with extensive, and um, anything more than 70 goes more with limited. Now, this is the study that basically um, helped produce this algorithm, um, and this was, I think, back in 2007. Um, and it was a prospective uh, study that basically enrolled patients with um, um, systemic scleroderma um, who had ILD on high-risk CT scan. Uh, number of patients after exclusion was around 200 patients. These patients were followed for 10 years um, with serial PFTs. Um, and the endpoint they looked at was mortality uh, and disease progression. And they, 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 they determined disease progression is being defined by a decline in FVC of more than 10% or a DSO of more than 15%. Uh, the thing to note with this is that patients with pulmonary hypertension were excluded. So this is just specifically looking at ILD. And what you'll see here is, um, based off of those definitions, um, when you plot them out, you find that this is why they use this to guide this algorithm into saying patients with extensive disease um, should get treatment and these can be monitored because your uh, survival is pretty, uh, pretty markedly different uh, when you group them into these specific categories. Um, and this data comes from right here. So when they initially uh, look at the FBCs above 70% and below 70% in terms of survival, you see a clear uh, difference here. And then the same thing applies with the high-risk CAT scan findings. When they're below 20% and above 20%, you see a, a big discordance. So they combine these two to make that algorithm, um, and that's a pretty helpful algorithm to help guide who's going to need treatment, because again, the prevalence is so high. These are the treatment options that are available. Um, and so the ones we're going to focus on are going to be cyclophosphamide and uh, mycophenolate, better known as Celsept. 
Um, we have uh, RCT trials that support the use of these medications. Other medications um, are azathioprine, uh, rituximab, which is being studied currently. You have stem cell transplants, which again, they're ongoing studies. Um, and there has really been no study to show that corticosteroid um, has an impro improves mortality, but that's also a therapeutic option that's used in patients. But the thing to caution there is again, the concern for uh, renal crisis. So I'm gonna focus on two studies um, with regards to uh, treatment of ILD in uh, patients with systemic scleroderma. And um, the first study is gonna be the SLS1, which is the scleroderma lung study one. And this I think came out around 2007 as well. Um, and basically this was an RCT double-blinded, randomized, and basically used an arm of placebo versus uh, cyclophosphamide. Uh, included 13 centers, um, and they included patients who had scleroderma, be it diffuse or limited, um, and they had to be symptomatic. So these are symptomatic patients with, um, with ILD. <coughs> they had to have restriction on their PFTs, and that was defined as an FBC less than 85%, but their DLC had to be more than 30% of predicted. They had to have active alveolitis. Uh, and so they defined that as having an, um, a BAL that showed evidence of active inflammation or a high-risk CAT scan that showed ground glass. And we're going to compare this to the following study that came after it where they dropped the use of BAL because we talked about earlier, BAL really doesn't help with prognostication here. Um, and also to emphasize, patients who, so patients could have pulmonary hypertension who were included in the study, but if they had uh, pulmonary, hypertension, uh, pulmonary hypertension that was significant enough to require treatment, they were excluded. Um, and the way the treatment was done here was the cyclophosphamide and the placebo was given for one year, but the patients were followed for two years. Um, and that's going to be an emphasis because the following study is, is going to be a little bit different. Um, and the primary endpoint that they looked at with this study was um, FPC at 12 months. And so these are the results that they, yes? Uh, correct. <laughs> You're probably right. Maybe that's what they started out at, perhaps. <laughs> I'd be wrong. You're probably right. <laughs> They're predominantly women, so. <laughs> so these are the results. Um, so. They ended up screening 267 patients and ended up randomizing 158 of them. Um, what you will find, and we'll get into this a little bit more, is that of these 158, um, only six, roughly 70% of each arm actually completed the study. Um, and it was a positive study in the sense that they found an absolute difference in FBC at 12 months that favored the cyclophosphamide arm. And that absolute difference was 2.53% at 12 months. Um, What's interesting to know, and this might, this is going to highlight a point here, is they did a secondary analysis that basically um, looked at these FBC changes as and, and compared it to the initial um, extent of fibrosis on the CAT scan. And what they found is that the patients who responded the most to the cyc in, in the cyclophosphamide arm were the patients who actually had the most fibrosis, um, and the patients who had the most significant drop in their FBC in the placebo arm with the patients who had the most fibrosis. So the treatment effect was more pronounced in patients who had more fibrosis. Um, and so the only thing to know is again, the adverse effects were, were, were seen with the cyclophosphine arm and they're mostly cytopenias. Um, and I'll display them on a, a chart we have. So this was really the study and I'm gonna highlight a couple things here. So some of the critique here is that there was a high rate of withdrawal. So you saw around only 70% of patients who were randomized ended up completing the study. Um, now, what's important to note is that if patients made it to six months with treatment, and then, for example, were lost to follow-up or some of their endpoints were not present, what they ended up doing in the study was they used a regression equation to sort of predict what those outcomes would have been. So they sort of created data to extrapolate what what the what those outcomes would have been, um, and they included those patients who had who had basically made it to six months, but perhaps not to twelve months. And so make of that what you will. And that included patients who had either died with withdrawn from treatment because of side effects, or um, who had treatment failure. <coughs> 
This right here highlights um, the difference in the extent of fibrosis uh, on uh, the effect of treatment. So you see plotting the degree of fibrosis on the baseline CAT scan against the FBC at 12 months. With the cyclophosphamide arm, you see that the treatment effect was more pronounced with higher levels of fibrosis, but the drop in FBC was more pronounced, again, with higher levels of fibrosis. So the, the delta effect was more prominent um, in <coughs> patients uh, in the treatment arm when patients had more fibrosis. So those are the patients who benefit most from, um, from treatment. These are again with the adverse effects, mostly were cytopenias. Um, they had, I believe, had one patient who had um, hemorrhagic cystitis from the cyclophosphamide. And there's also the concern, obviously, for malignancy when it comes to cyclophosphamide as well. A year after that, I think it was uh, 2008, they came out, the same authors, and this is uh, uh, Tashkin, came out with another paper. Um, and this time, they basically focused on the comprehensive analysis of their 24 month data. Um, so, what they found here was that the, 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 the improvements that you saw within the first 12 months had mostly dissipated by the time it was 24 months. The only thing that uh, persisted as far as an improvement was dyspnea scores. Um, and so that's an important note here is, you know, you found improvement at 12 months with your FEC, but 24 months later, that had almost completely gone. Yes. Correct. It maintains stability as opposed to increase their so like is going to be have, right. Really really Maintaining stability is, is, is great if you can achieve that. Absolutely. Yeah. The data when yeah. Data yeah. And yeah. And the same thing was done in the SLS2 study. So. Correct. Yeah. So the variability with N yeah, oh. Oh, I'm asking you because I'm I'm going on about two to five topics to to get. Well, it, it usually what we normally say between tests, 200 cc's and 12 percent. Right. That's quite a bit of variability, though. And then, uh, uh, which kind of puts into question a lot of these studies, for example, like the IPF studies that come out mm -hmm. for phenidone, uh, for phenidone where they say, hey, there's a, in two years, there's like a less, there's a 100 cc less decline in the treatment with both of the other ones. That's within the normal day to day variability of the test. So you have to have huge numbers. That's why I always look at those, those studies skeptically because it's definitely too much of anything. And I'm kind of thinking the same thing on, on this study here. We actually know, because the code points are scattered all over yeah, the place. Yeah, they are. They're so pretty there. And uh, we actually know what the percent difference is uh, can change in one function rather than the other. The absolute. Like, no. so like, like just two or three percent is kind of like smoking cessation. You right. Know, you know, for his boss growth said, hey, if you make one cent this year, uh, you know, you make two pennies next year, that's 100% profit. Right. There, uh, there were very small changes, but <laughs> nonetheless, they were stati statistically significant when, when they did their analysis. So they're very, very small changes, I, I agree. Because yeah, if you have changes like 100 cc yeah. difference, that's something patients don't even notice in their right. it's not even but the other, the sort of the secondary um, outcome they looked at were things like the breathlessness, um, their breathlessness, their basically their symptoms, and they had improvements in symptoms, their skin scores, um, amongst other things. So it, it it made a difference, independent of whether or not there was a change in their FEC. Patients had um, there was statistical significance when it came to improvements in their breathlessness scores and their skin scores as well. Right, now you have to consider also two years of psychophosphate mm -hmm. you can lose the benefit of the drug between one year and two years. Correct. I mean, we don't keep patients with regulars more than a couple months on psychotics and right. give them off bladder cancer. Uh -huh. So, you know, the trade off two years or something, that's a lot of psychophosphate. So, it was one year. It's because of their treatment, right? You're inducing, and then you put them on maintenance. You don't just leave them out there. It's not maintenance. Right. These are leaving them on for two years, psychophosphate. One year. It's 12 months, but they were followed for two years. Oh, so the answer two years. Yeah. It's still one year is a long time. Right. Again, no treatment. Yeah. Yeah. 
Clinically significant. Correct. What does that two point five mean? Right. Correct. Right. That's the more important question. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. What we're referring what to. You need okay. If I were to use those terms to you, mm-hmm. uh, primary outcome means that I designed the clinical trial. Powered for that to specific. Show that, powered to show that outcome. Right. It means that the step, secondary outcome is not powered for. And that's important, that's clinically Correct. significant because they were not what the study is designed to show. Correct. And so, really, in the study, we're going to think of what we're probably talking about. 200 patients. We're talking about an exploratory analysis. Right. Absolutely. I mean, the primary endpoint was FBC here. It wasn't. Right. It wasn't these other endpoints. You know, just to make another, even another point here, going uh-huh. back to Geneva here. You know, just uh, uh, they do a, a spygram on a patient that on the same day, same city, mm-hmm. where they have a good effort to test with you in five percent. Right. Okay. Well, on a five liter yeah. FBC, you're talking about a quarter of a liter, 250 cc, right. greater than that you're talking about here right. at that point. Yeah. Uh, so again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that's on the same patient on the same day. Right. And then keep in mind also, what well, these five reps will get better with training mm-hmm. as well. So I think initially part of the inclusion was they, they couldn't have more than, and this is, they used 10% variability on that initial um, spirogram when they enrolled them in the study. But I don't know if they they sort of had that same approach with each subsequent um, spirogram that they did. Yeah. So they use 10. I mean, and then, I think in terms of um, what people did with this information, mm-hmm. as soon as something else was available, yeah. the centers moved to that. Before the big, you know, the, before SLS2 was being done, people were moving away from that. Right. And I think, honestly, for me, the biggest problem with this is the, about twi- like I said, about fifth of, fifth of the patients, they had to carry for or repeat, calculate, um, PFT score based on their, their regression analysis, which to me means like you're predicting that mm-hmm. that is not real, that's yeah. not real work. What are you doing? Yeah. You know, just on the mention of the previous year past, uh-huh. most of these patients have Renaud's phenomenon. Right. And there's this really good studies, 30, 40 patients that have Renaud's mm-hmm. with the music cast on them. You stick your hands in cold water, and it change drops by 20%. Okay. Okay. So again, if you're going to retest the patient, make sure that like this in the time, they have their gloves and coat on for 15 minutes before you test them. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, you see the magic drop and you'll have the party you have everything else on. Right. They bounce all over the place here. I see. <coughs> so, these are all food for thought. Um, skip over this here. Um, we'll go into the SLS2 study, which just got published in September. Um, and so it was the same authors um, who basically carried out this study and this time again it was multi-center, it was 14, 14 centers, double-blinded, um, randomized, and um, this is wrong here, so mistake that, but the two arms were um, um, Celsept or mycophenolate um, comparing uh, that to cyclophosphamide. Um, and their primary endpoint here was FVC at 24 months. Um, and so a lot of the same criteria was used. The only thing that changed um, really was they dropped the BAL requirement. They just went off of active um, sort of alveolitis based off of ground glass findings on high-risk CAT scan. Um, and then the treatment uh, with, so the treatment for the cell sept was for 24 months um, and the treatment for the, um, for the cyclophosphamide was for 12 months after which they were taking uh, pretty much like a placebo pill. So these are the results. Um, and so they, they screened uh, almost 200 patients, of which 142 were randomized. Um, and then of these patients, um, roughly 70, 70 in each arm completed the study. Um, and it was a negative study for their primary, um, for their primary endpoint. So what they found was um, <coughs> there was a, 
there was an absolute difference in FEC in both arms. So the FEC had increased. So in the first arm, in with, with regards to the cell sept, there's an increase in 2.19%, uh, um, as opposed to the 2.88% <coughs> in the cyclophosphamide arm. But when you compared the two groups um, and, found and, and, and sort of uh, determined that difference, which is, again, their primary outpoint, uh, endpoint, comparing the two arms, um, there, there was no uh, significant difference between the two arms. Um, however, on a post hoc analysis where they looked at each uh, group in and of itself, um, what they did find was that each arm had a sti was statistically significant for an improvement in the FBC, um, in addition to things like the skin score findings and um, their dyspnea scores. Um, what you'll find in this study is that um, fewer patients in the, cell in the cell sept arm left the study as opposed to the cyclophosphamide, so it's about 20% versus 32%. There's fewer treatment failure for the cell sept, a very small number, but zero versus two patients. Um, and then the side effects were markedly um, improved with the, with the cell sept arm. So leukopenia was 30 patients as opposed to four, thrombocytopenia was four as opposed to zero, um, all again favoring cell sept. And then by the withdrawal, you mean had to stop the medication? They stopped the medication. Yeah. yeah, so most of them stopped the medication because of side effects. Um, but the same, um, and this is, this is the breakdown of, of the study, and so th the same, you know, so this is where you had the 20 patients drop in the, in the cell sept arm and 36% drop there, um, and they break them down to treatment failure and how many patients died. Um, but they also did use the same approach in this study that they did in the SLS1 study. So patients who had made it to 12 months um, who would then, you know, either withdrew or had treatment failure um, or were lost to follow-up, those patients were also still included. They still sort of extrapolated data um, and then use that for the final analysis. So it's the same, yes? And again, just the, so when it says 19 mm -hmm. withdrew, that doesn't mean that they didn't have CFTs for them. They Although, I mean, like, I think their final shows, like, there's 14 that didn't have, sorry, 16 that didn't have CFT data, right? That's the months? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then they say, and kind of similar for the other one, 20, 20 that's right. in the other and the other thing to know in the study was the patients who withdrew from the cyclophosphamide arm, whether it was from side effects or from treatment mm -hmm. failure, those patients were allowed to enroll in treatments with other types of medication. So they could have potentially enrolled and gotten um, Celsept or Rituxan, mm -hmm. um, and they were still included in the final analysis. So mm -hmm. that kind of skews your data as well, because you have patients who are now getting a different form of treatment being included in the final analysis when your initial arms are uh, cell sept comparing, uh, compared to um, cyclophosphamide. And so this is, um, this is really the, the graphing that you see. So it's the FBC uh, plotted against time, and you see that there's an increase in FBC in both arms, but again, there's no stati statistical uh, stat difference between both arms. Um, and this was a breakdown of sort of their, the, the characteristics starting out the study here. So they basically scored patients for the degree of fibrosis, um, their dyspnea score, um, their DLCO, their FEC, their TLC, and, um, and they plotted them, but I won't, I won't get into that here. Adverse effects, um, so again, I touched on that earlier, but there was much more of um, the cytopenias um, as an ad adverse effect seen in the cyclophosphamide arm. These are some of the other treatment options that, are, uh, that have been looked at and are at times used uh, for treating patients with um, systemic scleroderma ILD. Um, so rituxan is one of those medications. It's um, an anti-CD20 antibody treatment. Um, and really there's been limited studies looking at this. There's only been a cohort study from the Eurostar and that's only enrolled nine patients. Um, but they did, they did find that there was potentially some improvement and there's some ongoing studies to look into that. Um, so that's potentially something that could be uh, beneficial on the horizon. An interesting uh, option as well is um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So again, because of the immune dysregulation in these patients, um, the thought process is that by, by, um, by sort of resetting the immune system, um, that could potentially affect um, the disease progression. Um, and there have been some early non-randomized trials um, that showed an uh, improvement in high-risk CAT scan findings um, as far as this uh, degree of disease, as well as oxygenation. Um, and then there's currently an active study that's ongoing, um, and I think it got started in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, um, comparing cyclophosphamide 
in one arm and transplantation um, in the other arm. And so um, that's still ongoing and there's no data from that as of yet. Steroids, uh, you know, are used, but there's never been any proven efficacy. Um, and of course the concern is the precipitation of uh, renal crisis. There have been two retrospective studies that have, been that have looked at the uh, development of um, renal crisis in the setting of um, steroid use. And again, the correlation with higher doses um, correlating with <coughs> a higher incidence of a renal crisis. But a safe dose is considered to be somewhere at or below 15 milligrams a day. Another note, I didn't include this anti as an antifibrotic agent, but um, there, are, there are studies looking into this. Um, so Henry Ford is one of the sites that's looking into uh, nintedinib, if I pronounced that correctly, um, as a, a placebo-controlled randomized control trial for patients with uh, systemic sclerosis. The patients can be on, can be on cell cells as long as it's a stable dose for the last six months. They have to be diagnosed within the last five years. Um, cannot have pH that's significant enough that we want it's uh, therapy. Therapy. So similar. Have, uh, renal so severe that they have active ulcers. I see. Um, okay. The some data is that there's improvement in skin disorder, maybe even vasculopathy, okay. um, and, and perhaps biopathy. The other study that was done, which I don't know if you just mentioned it, with uh, Pathenadone, it's no, no. Um, finished. It's finished and rolling now. Okay. Um, U of M was a site, and now their site for this as well, so I think they've gotten rolling. Um, there's just early um, prelim data from other trials with, say, talking about potential stability again, um, but we don't have the, the data. The data itself. Okay. Yeah. So, less of an emphasis on the pH component, um, but again, all the different treatment options that are used in group 1 pH um, are available for these patients. Um, Prevalence, again, is, is quite high, it exceeds 10%, and that's why screening is important. Um, there's a study that I briefly mentioned that basically gives an algorithm um, as far to, to, to sort of guide uh, the screening approach in these patients. Um, and again, what's notable is that patients within um, class one who have PH secondary to systemic sclerosis are the patients who are least responsive and have the highest mortality as compared to all the other patients within that grouping. Um, and again, there have been no randomized control trials specifically looking at um, survival benefit and treatment in these patients specifically. Most of studies have included uh, just a broad cohort of patients with systemic sclerosis, associated pH, in addition to pH with other con uh, connective tissue diseases. So there's been no single study to look at it in isolation. Um, and this was the, um, the one study that was recently put out um, to help guide screening, and I believe it was called the DECIDE trial, or the decision, just the detect, detect trial. Um, and so the, the take home point here is that they were trying to sort of um, determine, you know, w what, what variables could you use to help guide whether or not you need to proceed down screen with an echocardiogram, potentially a right heart cath, and which patients could potentially get away with not requiring um, screen with echocardiography. And so these are some of the variables they looked at, um, but I'm not going to go into this, uh, this, this specific study here. Right, right. In general, the previous to this, the guideline recommendation was that every patient should technically have um, an echocardiogram done as part of the screening yearly, uh, just because of the high incidence and associated mortality, because you could potentially offer them treatment. Um, so I'm not sure if this study changed that, or if the, the clinical practice is to still get that echocardiogram on a yearly basis. The same year that this came out is when the um, hypertension uh, uh, without guidelines was recommended, and that was the new recommendation mm -hmm. that year that every that scleroderma patient gets yearly. Yearly, so correct. As you show that data, it will be longer. Correct. Um, that it can show up much later. Um, in right. So I think most people will still get the mm -hmm. echocardiogram every year. Um, so there have been limited studies looking at um, the treatment of uh, systemic sclerosis PAH. Um, specifically, there's one study that looked at IV uh, proprostanol, um, and basically there was no improvement in mortality, but there was, again, improvement in surrogate outcomes with um, predominantly symptomatic improvement. Um, other data that we get basically comes from inclusion of other pa patients with, a, uh, with um, connective tissue disease, so um, that's where we get a lot of them. 
in the EULAR guidelines, and this is more mm -hmm. in Europe, where the, th their recommendation is for uh, using Vicentin as a first line treatment, um, but also recommend potentially using sildenafil or IV for um as well. So lung transplantation is the other option that's available for these patients uh, for both either ILD or PH. Um, and what's important to note here is that outcomes are similar <laughs> for these patients as they are for any other patient that's transplanted. So those two and five year outcomes are, uh, mortality outcomes are, are similar. Um, and a contraindication is a peristalsis, but in talking to Dr. Thavaraja, you know, patients who do get a GJ tube um, at the expense of, again, not being able to eat thereafter, potentially could be candidates for um, lung transplantation. Um, and again, this is also an option for patients who have uh, PAH and failed treatment. Um, and they have similar outcomes uh, as, the, as cause compared to patients who have IPF and uh, um, idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension. The last thing I'll touch on is GERD. Um, there's been some that suggest that patients who have more esophageal dysmotility or aperistalsis um, are tend to have higher s uh, increased severity of disease uh, when it comes to their ILD. And the, the s you know, the, the hypothesis is that it's the reflux um, and the, the microaspiration that could be correlating both of those uh, together. Um, and really, a, the one thing I want to highlight here is that the Nissan fund application is not an option for these patients because of the dysmotility. So it's really lifestyle management options, um, prokinetics, the PPIs, and potentially patients who, who you know who are significantly high risk, um, potentially like something like a GJ tube is used. So these are the conclusions I want to highlight from all of this. Um, some take home points. So. The lung disease in scleroderma accounts for the majority of deaths ever since uh, ACE inhibitors have been introduced for treatments of uh, the renal crisis. Um, but the lung disease itself is under-recognized in this population. Um, and because we do have treatment options, it's important to, to really pick up on these patients. Um, patients who do develop significant uh, ILD disease tend to do so early on after their diagnosis. So going back to that discussion we had earlier. Um, the way to screen these patients uh, is really with the use of PFTs and high-risk CAT scan. That's going to help guide your decision making um, as far as putting them into extensive or, lim um, or limited disease and guide whether or not they need tra treatment or surveillance. Um, but the patients who have mild disease requiring fre frequent PFTs for initially at least the first five years. Um, also, I believe the current practice is still to continue with yearly echocardiograms uh, to screen for pulmonary artery hypertension in these patients. Um, but again, every patient is different and you individualize the treatment um, based off of you know, how clinically significant their disease is and what you anticipate the, the disease course is going to be like going forward. Um, and the two treatments that we have that are supported by RCT trials are currently cyclophosphamide and salsa based off the SLS1 and 2 trials, but there are currently multiple ongoing trials looking into other treatment options. And that ends my talk. Any questions? Everybody satisfied? <laughs>